Rix, uh, Rix195 says you're a Zionist Christian, and Abdullah Amid says he wants me to tell you that he wants to become a Christian. So, Abdullah Amir, or, or whatever your name is, and I apologize, I didn't quite catch it. Contact me, BTB Soco, S O C O, at gmail.com. Email me, let's talk, bro. You're not the first Muslim to become a Christian. I was at a church today, and there were eight Muslims that were all Christian at the church that I was at. What's the name of your channel? Uh, it's called Euro Maestro. Euro Maestro. Happy all the viewers at Euro Maestro. Action! Okay. So I want to do a talk about the Trinity. And what I'm going to focus in on is the deep philosophical meditation and reflection that the church has given to the biblical verses that we just dis discussed with our um, Bible student friend. Now, what we need to be clear about is what the Trinity is and what the Trinity isn't. What the Trinity is, is a belief that, the, that in three persons who share in one divine essence. And I'm just focusing in on the philosophical reflection. So this isn't looking at the Bible, it's looking at the reflection philosophically on the Bible. It isn't a belief that three persons are one person, and it isn't a belief in three gods. It is a belief in one God who exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the church that is, the language that is used by the church to describe this in its philosophical reflections are the words hypostasis to refer to persons and usia to refer to essence. Now, a hypostasis is not necessarily relational or rational. It depends on the nature of the hypostasis in question. So when we're speaking of the divine hypostases, i.e. Father, Son and Holy Spirit, we're speaking of things that are relational and rational. And so we use the term person. That's, that's the best translation that we use. However, when we're speaking of the persons of the Trinity, we're not talking about visible, separate, spatial beings, which is why to assert that the Father, Son and Holy Spirit is one in being is not the equivalent of talking about three human beings. That's not what we're saying, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about in the same way that the X, Y, Z axes are all dimensions, so they're the same thing, but they're not the same dimension, so they're all different. Now, if you can accept that the X, Y, Z axes of three-dimensional space exist, and that is a non-contradictory statement, then there are no grounds to claim that the idea of the three hypostases, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, sharing in the same essence, is a contradiction. You can't accept a trinity in one formula, but then reject it in another one. That's an irrational cognitive dissonance and an irrational argument. Now, Christians don't believe in three gods. We're not tri-theists. I want to be clear about that. The Father is how God is used in the New Testament by our Lord Jesus Christ himself. Our Lord Jesus Christ himself refers to God as the Father. The divine nature that the Word of God is emanates from the Father. The Logos, that word of God spoken by the Father, is coming from the Father. It's generated by the Father. Now, if God is eternal and unchanging and has always been the Father, the obvious question is, who has he been the Father to? Now, it can't be creation because creation is not eternal. So it has to be something uncreated. And this we call the Son, the Divine Logos. And the Father cannot be without His Word. 
The Word of God is as eternal as God himself. And so, the Logos, which is the Son, is coming eternally from the Father. If you listen, you'll learn. Now, we Christians, therefore, believe in the Holy Trinity. We believe in the Holy Trinity. We don't believe in tritheism. There is one God, Father. There is one divine Logos, the Son. This is what we believe. And there is one Holy Spirit from God, which is the Spirit of God. Now, the word God is used within Christian theology in a particular sense. It is in terms of the divine nature. It is not, in, in, and it is specifically in terms of the Father. This is called the monarchical theology. This is how we reflect upon our bro. Brother, you're knocking the camera. Like, just, just try to be polite. Just try to be polite. I'm giving, I've accepted your apologies, but don't be an asshole. Relax. Right. So. So. Bro, just be polite. Yeah, well, you're not listening, you're interrupting and you're kicking the camera. Thank you very much. Okay, so, as we can see, we Christians believe in one divine essence, one divine nature. Again, I use the example, now you're kicking all of those people. Bro, control your bike. So, in terms of the divine nature, we believe in one and only one. In the same way that you can accept that dimensional space is the same thing even though it exists equally and indivisibly along an X, Y and Z axis. As we can see therefore, Christianity differs from Greek polytheism which believes in many deities, separate beings with separate divine natures, not the same divine nature. So, those that accuse Christians of monotheism are correct. Those that accuse Christians of polytheism, which is the word I was wanting to use, are incorrect. It's a straw man argument. It's made by ignorant people, not people who are actually engaging with the Christian faith. So, we're not talking about the particulars that have the divine nature, i.e. the divine persons. So Judaism and Muslims believe in one divine nature existent within one person. Christians believe in one divine nature existent within three persons. Polytheists believe in multiple divine natures in multiple divine persons. The contrasts are obvious. The above example of three hypostases and one oesia can be mistaken by those who are not familiar with the language as believing in three gods. Hence why I'm giving the correction right now. Let us think about how can something be distinct and the same. Let us think about how things can be distinct and the same. I'll give you some examples. Number one, three-dimensional space. You're stood in it right now. You exist in it at this exact moment in time. The x-axis is not the y-axis. The y-axis is not the z-axis. You accept that these things are a plurality, but each dimension, x, y and z, is fully, completely a dimension. And it is identical to the other two dimensions. That is a trinity. And if you can cognitively grasp that trinity, 
then you have no excuse for saying that the Trinity is not understandable because it works in exactly the same principle. Now, another example. The idea of a flame, light and heat. Flame, light and heat are all the same thing. They are all existent in the electromagnetic spectrum. There are three examples of the same thing. So, if we can accept these analogies as demonstrating unity and plurality, then there is no reason to argue that the Trinity is irrational or contradictory. Now, how is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit distinct from one another? We Christians believe in two processions. The Father we call the uncaused, unoriginate, i.e. it is dependent upon nothing. But the Son is begotten of the Father outside of time and eternally. And so the Son is not the Father. But the Son is not created because his eternal generation is outside of space and time and coming from the Eternal Father. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. He is not someone who pro the Father proceeds from, nor is he the Son who is begotten. So the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and is thus distinct from the Son and the Father. And this procession again is outside of time. It is eternal. It does not have a beginning. And so the distinction is relational, not temporal. Causation does not require causation and requiring sequence. Let's think about that. The language of begetting and proceeding to those who do not consider the fact that this begetting and proceeding is outside of time could be understood mistakenly as the Father creating the Son and the Holy Spirit. We don't believe that because to be caused does not mean to be created. They are not the same thing. Being created means that you come into existence. Being caused means that you originate from something. If you originate from something that is eternal, you yourself are eternal. Imagine for a second a mountain and in the mountain there is an underground lake and springing forth from the underground lake are two rivers. If the mountain and the lake and the rivers are eternal, we can say that the rivers are caused by the underground lake. But if, we are eter if they are eternal, we don't say that one creates the other, we say that one causes the other. These two words are not the same. So what do we mean by consubstantial? We Christians describe the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit as being consubstantial. What we mean by this is that they are made of exactly the same thing. Not three separate things, but one and the same thing, undivided and indivisible. They are exactly the same at exactly the same time, without beginning or without end. And this is why the church says, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Those who try to isolate the person, listen, 
If the terms Father, Son and Spirit refer to eternal relations, we are not speaking, therefore, of sequentiality. We're not speaking that one was first and the other was second and the third, then there was a third. And therefore, when we speak of God as Father, we cannot think of him as not having a son. When we speak of the Father, we must always speak of him as having a son. Therefore, other monotheists like Jews and Muslims do not believe in God the Father that we believe in. When Muslims say we believe in God the Father, no, they don't. Because the Father that they believe in was not eternally the Father. He was someone who became the Father. So it's not theologically the same Father we believe in. They aren't thinking of the same God of Jesus Christ, who said, the only true God and Father. That is what Jesus was speaking about. Thus Jesus said to the Pharisees, if you knew the Father, you would recognize me because I came from the Father. Jesus originates not from heaven, not from nothingness, but from the Father himself. And that is why he is also eternal. The persons of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, Spirit are ontologically the same. They are not sequences in development. They cannot be thought of in isolation. If we think of the Holy Spirit, we must also speak of the Father and the Son. If we speak of the Son, we must also speak of the Father and the Holy Spirit. And if we speak of the Father, we must speak of his word and we must speak of his spirit. If the Spirit and the Son are caused by the Father, does that mean that they are inferior? Christians believe in a functional subordination in the Trinity, where the Son and the Spirit do the will of the Father because they have the will of the Father. Their will is the same. It isn't three separate wills. And so, they are not ontologically inferior. They are not lesser gods. They are the same God with the same will and the same mind and the same essence. And that is why we say they are one. Just. So in summary, this is a summary of the, theolog the philosophical reflections of the church upon the Christian scriptures. Those who try to argue that the Son is inferior to the Father, or that the Son is not God, is not the God of the Father, sorry, is not the same divine essence of the Father, or believe that Christians believe in three gods, or that Christ was not God. All of them are arguing against straw men. They are arguing against false apparitions of their own imagination. And we have multiple of them here in the park. Hashim, Mansour, Shamsi, Mohammed Hijab. They all argue against the inventions of their own imagination, not what Christians believe. Perfect. Any questions? <laughs> questions going once. Questions the Bob and the Trinity. Any questions on the Trinity? Do you think it's polytheistic? Questions going twice. So go up. Okay, so the question is question. We've got Trinity. Now, can you explain for us Repeat the question, how please. the Trinity 
Repeat the question. Yeah. Hey, hold on, hold on. Okay, okay, no problem. How does the Trinity work when we have some differences between God the Holy Spirit and God the Son or God the Father, as in when there is sin which cannot be forgiven in respect of one, but sins that can be forgiven in respect of the other or others. You probably know what I'm referring to. Yeah, the blasphemy against the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Yes, please, if you'd like to explain that. In so the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is to reject the free gift of salvation that the Holy Spirit invites us all to accept. Christians believe within salvation, within the work of salvation, Father, Son and Holy Spirit are each, as it were, doing their own, they're working as one, they're acting as one, but we ascribe to them different works. So the Father sends the Son, the Son suffers on the cross, and the Holy Spirit glorifies the Son and brings all people to His truth. If you reject that work of the Holy Spirit, that free gift of salvation, then you have blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. You've denied the work of the Holy Spirit. And to deny the free gift of salvation is a sin that can never be forgiven. And you will pay your debt. Sorry? Exactly. There were people, that are, there are always people who have hearts of stone that reject the inclining and the invitation of the Spirit to listen to the Gospel. I don't know if you are one, sir. I mean, are you a Christian? Okay, so in terms of, in terms of those that reject the Holy Spirit, reject that invitation to accept Jesus Christ, they will have to suffer for that blasphemy that says, I hear your invitation, but I refuse it. Any other questions? Questions going once? Questions going once. Questions going once. Questions going twice. Questions going twice. Okay, no questions. Guys, have a good day. So for those of you that don't know, you can watch the programs that we make on SoCo Films. SoCo Films. S-O-C-O -O Films. Not so called films as everybody thinks it is. Oh wait, we got one quick question from of you. Not about the Trinity, sorry. Yeah. We're done. Okay, I'm going to stop. Yeah, yeah, while you're, you're packing up, because I'm stopping yeah, now, but while you're packing up, I'll take this question. Oh, my sorry, my sorry, it's recorded. Can I lightly beat her? One question. Sorry? Adam says, if my wife is disobedient, can I lightly beat her? No, and if you do, you're a jackass. <laughs> and a heretic if you claim to be a Christian while doing it. Because, well, I wouldn't go that far, I would just say they're in grievous error. But I, I would say that that's a, an injunction in the Quran, and it denigrates, and it denigrates women. Whereas Christians believe in the nobility of women because they are made in the image of God and that means they have equal dignity to the man. And so beating a woman, and I accept that it was a widely done practice even by many Christians, it's not, it's not something that's taught in the Bible. Adam says it's Islamic. I know that. Yeah. And, and, I, and this is another reason why we should reject Islam. Amen. And another reason why we should oppose the Islamization of our legal systems and cultures. Because Islamization would legitimize the lightly beating of women. And I would say to you that if you need to lightly beat your woman, something has gone seriously wrong in your relationship and perhaps you share some of the blame. Rick, uh, Rick says you're a Zionist you Christian. Pack up. I'm, I'm going to stop. I'm packing up. Okay, yeah, go on. Rick's, uh, Rick's 195 says you're a Zionist Christian. And Abdullah Amid says he wants me to tell you that he wants to become a Christian. So, Abdullah, 
Amir or, or whatever your name is, and I apologize, I didn't quite catch it. Contact me, B-T-B Soco, S-O-C-O, at gmail.com. Email me, let's talk, bro. You're not the first Muslim to become a Christian. I was at a church today, and there were eight Muslims that were all Christian at the church that I was at this morning. So there's many, many Muslims becoming Christians. You won't be the first, you won't be the last. Let me just reply to the Zionist comment. I am someone that does not believe that the, that, that the, that, that the church is subject to Israel. Israel have a covenant with God that entitles them to the land in Palestine. But that doesn't mean that the Jews have the right to do whatever they want in Israel. It doesn't give them the right to abuse Palestinians, many of whom are Palestinian Christians. And I think that we should be standing up for Palestinian Christians who are suffering at the hands of the Jews because they're Palestinian and at the hands of Hamas and other Muslims because they're Christian. And that's where our voice needs to be as Christians. So Adam apologized for his question. Uh, Rick says, uh, Bob, many Christians have become Muslims. And Ibrahim 783 says, didn't a Jew kill your God, Bob? So let's just reply to Rick. Right now in Indonesia, there are thousands of Muslims becoming Christians. Christianity is the fastest growing religion in Indonesia. 500 years ago, 100 years ago, you wouldn't have found a Christian in Saudi Arabia. Not only are there 2 million Christians in Arabia, there are Christians who have converted from Islam in Saudi Arabia. There are Christians worshipping Jesus in Mecca and in Medina. There are Christians, there are people becoming Christians by the thousands in Iran. Christianity is the fastest growing religion in North Sudan. Christianity is not by any means a defeated religion. All Pew Research shows that Christianity is still a growing religion. And so this boast, yes, there are many Christians becoming Muslims. I've met many of these Christians becoming Muslims and to a dot, with a handful only exceptions, they're not actually Christians, they're just cultural Christians. I.e. they call themselves Christians without ever actually practicing the faith. I can count on one hand the number of actual Christians I have met who become Muslim. But I can't count on one hand the number of actual Muslims that have become Christian. Any other questions? Yeah, there's a few. Claire, Claire says, I have a question. Why can't different religions just accept people have different beliefs and get along? Because different religions don't teach that stuff. That is hippie crap that is the kind of mantra of hippies. If you actually look about what Islam teaches, it teaches that if a Muslim becomes a Christian, he should be killed. That's what Islam teaches. Now, why as a Christian should I accept that? Why as a Christian should I cower to that? Islam teaches that I as a Christian should be made a second class citizen called a dhimmi. Why as a Christian should I accept that? Why as a Christian should I cower to that or back down to that? Conflict is inevitable and it is a fantasy of people that say, well, all religions should just get along. I can't get along with people that say that my brothers and sisters should be killed, persecuted and treat as second class citizens. I just can't do that. And if I did, I wouldn't be a just person. Islam teaches that you can own slaves. I don't think you should be able to own slaves. So I have to oppose Islam. So uh, Rick says, uh, Bob, why do you believe a man is God? That's idol worship. Rick, contact me on btbsoco at gmail.com and I'll talk about it. Anyone who's got any further questions, I'm stopping now. Anyone who's got any further questions, btbsoco at gmail.com. Bravo, Tango, Bravo. Sierra, Oscar, Charlie, Oscar at gmail.com and I will write me and I'll answer your questions. All right, God bless, take care. Let's go. Cut!